Hey, I'm Roberta Blevins, and this is Life After MLM. Hey, welcome to the very first episode of my new podcast, <laughs> Life After MLM. I'm Roberta Blevins. Maybe you've heard of me, maybe you haven't. Welcome either way. I'm glad to have you. I decided to start my own podcast uh, because I had been interviewed in so many and I had been a co-host on some and I I think I just wanted to try it out myself. Um, I've always sort of had this want and this vision to go down this avenue and the pandemic sort of gave me the time to think about it and I decided to do it. So please forgive me in the beginning. It's going to be a little shaky. I've never done this all by myself. I've always had a co-host with me or somebody to interview. I've never interviewed myself, which is also very awkward, but I thought the first episode should be sort of a introduction to me and a little bit of my story, though you've probably most likely already heard it. If not, you know, go ahead and pause this and um, check out any of the media stuff that I've done. They tell the story far better than I could in a much more succinct way (laughs) Um, and come back to this. But it's nice to have you guys here. I, I just, this is such a fun thing for me and such a a new creative outlet. So I'm really excited that you're here on this journey with me and I hope that you stay and I hope that you um, subscribe to this and and listen as I get new interviews out. Um, My entire thought process behind this podcast was to create a um, educational resource and a safe place for people who were either leaving multi-level marketing or who had left multi-level marketing and and were looking for relatable content or maybe somebody who um, just wanted a deeper explanation or, you know, a safe place to come to get answers to questions that they may not know they had. So that's sort of how this started. Um, I've always really enjoyed sharing my story and opening the eyes of other people who have never heard the deeper aspects of multi-level marketing. Um, And over the last three and a half years that I've been an advocate against multi-level marketing, I've learned a lot, Um, oddly enough and surprisingly enough. I've I've really, um, it's sort of become a new hobby. Um, Sometimes it takes over my life a little bit too much, and other times it takes it over so much that I disappear for weeks on end. But this is such an interesting niche that we have here and I see it getting a lot bigger in the future and um, another reason this podcast was born was because I really don't like the hun shaming and the hate and the mean bullying that I see sometimes on the anti-MLM side. Um, I know that we're better than that (laughs) and I know that there's a lot of other creators and advocates out there that feel the same way. Um, I'm very, very excited to be having those people on the show in future episodes to talk about their advocacy and and how they see the future of anti-MLM going as well. Um, And not only talking to other advocates and survivors, but talking to experts in their fields as well. Um, I really want to dive into the different aspects of psychological aspects of multi-level marketing, the financial aspects of multi-level marketing, the business aspects. and be able to create uh, an educational resource, like I said, where people can can get answers without feeling like they're going to be made fun of or called names or attacked. I know I'm not really much of a confrontational person. I don't like attacking people. I don't like being attacked. Um, from someone who's helped thousands of women and men leave multi-level marketing, that approach just doesn't work. Um, the educational, compassionate approach and being there when someone has a question and being able to talk to them in a way where they understand what you're saying, um, that works. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the focus of this podcast. That's the focus of my work and my advocacy. That's the focus of everything that I've done going forward. 
um, from the moment that I left multi-level marketing as an industry to today and going forward until I don't need to be a voice for people anymore, which I don't really see that ever happening, but you know, we can dream, right? <laughs> um, so I guess I just want to talk about myself now for a second, which uh, is kind of awkward for me to just sit and talk about myself to myself. Um, so I want to say, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty educated person. Um, I have a pretty good head on my shoulders. I'm pretty grounded. Um, I think that I am a pretty decent human when it comes to helping others and being involved in the community and, and fighting for what uh, is right. I think I have a pretty good track record of that my entire life. Um, but anybody, including somebody like me, and most likely including somebody like you, can get stuck and caught up in the idea of the lies that are fed in multi-level marketing. Uh, that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, in 2013, my father was diagnosed with advanced stage four terminal pancreatic cancer. Um, we were told he had a year to live, and I think we got about two and a half months. Uh, he died about <laughs> 11 or 12 days before my wedding. Um, and I had just, I had about a, a year old daughter with me at the time as well. So I was a new mom, I was about to be a new wife, and I was losing my father uh, very unexpectedly. So a lot of those things are very high stress and can put you in a place where you are vulnerable. And it's not something that you expect, and it's not something that you prepare for. You know, when tragedy and loss and, and bad stuff strikes, it's not always something that you're like, oh, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> and so um, all of those things compounded on top of me made me incredibly vulnerable, incredibly um, susceptible to finding just any sort of good in the world at that time. I, I felt very lost and alone. And um, I was just really the perfect person for multi-level marketing to come in and swoop and snatch. So the very, very, very first time I ever signed up for any sort of multi-level marketing product. And I'll tell you, before this, I had supported them. Uh, I had bought makeup from different companies and had supported my friends or thought I had been supporting my friends and family, buying makeup and cleaning products and, and things like that um, in companies that were multi-level marketing companies. And again, I had no idea about the CD underbelly of it. So I thought I was doing a good thing and I thought I was helping someone who needed help. Again, I'm the perfect candidate for multi-level marketing. I cannot stress this enough. Um, maybe some of you are <laughs> smiling and, and nodding your heads because you also are like that in the perfect candidate. And that's probably why you got sucked in as well. But in 2014, my cousin, who's just one of my favorite people in the whole entire world, uh, started selling It Works. And she was, you know, bragging about all of the benefits of, of the wraps and the vitamins and all of this stuff. And because my dad's death had affected me so hard, I, you know, went to the, the unhealthy habits that I had of like eating badly and not wanting to go do things and being depressed and, and, and just wanting to be left alone and just left to, to mourn, you know, it's the first time anybody really close to me had died. And, and for me, it was really, really hard. I mean, I was a daddy's girl, so it was really, really, really difficult for me to process that. And, um, I still think seven and a half years later that I haven't completely processed all of it, but each day it does get a little easier. So in 2014, almost a year after my dad had passed away, my cousin started selling at works and she had invited me to a party and I told her I was skeptical and she's like, let me send you a wrap for free. And she did. And I tried it and you know, lo and behold, it worked. I was like, oh my God, it does work. Um, and <laughs> 
uh, you know, I didn't think of any other external factors of like just water weight. Like you drank a bunch of water and you peed it all out. Like you measured yourself in the morning when you're the smallest. Like there was a lot of things that I didn't factor in. I was just like, oh my God, these magic wraps work. And when I went and had a party for her and invited all my friends, a lot of people, um, were purchasing things. I think somebody wanted to sign up and she came to me at, in the party and she said, look, if you sign up, all of these things that you sold, you would get, you know, and it wasn't a predatory way. It was just, it was just like, Hey, like I want to help you out because this company is helping me out too. And I was like, okay. And she's like, if you sign up, you know, you've already earned like $200 if, if this was your party. So, you know, basically signing up for free and you're going to get all this stuff on top of it. And why not? You get these vitamins that you were looking at and you get those wraps that you liked and all of these things. And so I said, okay, why not? So I jumped in, it was $99 and I jumped in and I thought, well, I got all this stuff for 99 bucks. Great. Well, someone asked me about it, a friend of mine. And I was like, oh yeah, I tried him. And she's like, I've always wanted to join. And so she then wanted to join underneath me. And I thought, well, maybe I could just try to make some money off of this. And it was not my niche at all. Like I'm a cosmetologist. I'm in the beauty industry, like selling fat wraps <laughs> and vitamins is not anything that I knew anything about. And so I tried my best, but after about three months, I realized that it was really not anything I wanted to do. I wasn't a salesperson. Um, people weren't super interested in it. You know, my biggest customer was like my mom, which is like so obvious when you join these companies that your biggest customers are going to be your closest friends and family. I had a couple of friends that, that wanted to join. I, I don't know. At the end of the year, when I got my tax info from the company, I think I had made $700, which for three months of work is nothing, you know? Um, so I was like, that was a waste of time. And I realized, I thought at the time that like these companies were just scams and there was no way that you could actually make any significant money. And that was in 2014. It wasn't even until a year later that I was introduced to LuLaRoe, which is most likely the company that you know me from and my advocacy against the company. <laughs> so I joined LuLaRoe in 2016, but I first heard about it in 2015. And I tell you that it was like six months of grooming to get me to sign those papers and join the company. I want to say I started hearing about it in like September or October of 2015 and did so much research. I Googled, is LuLaRoe a scam? Is LuLaRoe a pyramid scheme? Um, LuLaRoe bad, like looking for any sort of press at all. I couldn't find anything at that time. I couldn't find anything. There was nothing negative about the company that I could personally find. Um, so I started asking people that sold it. I started joining groups of like VIP groups and, and watching these sales and sort of doing my own market research and seeing how fast things were selling. And it was insane how fast everything was flying out the shelves. A lot of the stuff I thought was like, whoa, that's a little too much for me. Um, I did enjoy the florals and, and the solids. Um, and some of the novelty prints for holidays. But for the most part, like a lot of the prints to me were very like harsh and brash. And I knew people wanted to buy it because I was literally watching them sell out of everything as fast as possible. And so I started reaching out to people on YouTube that were making these recruitment videos, <laughs> which I look back on it now and I'm like, what a genius idea. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't realize the whole thing revolved around recruiting when I started looking into LuLaRoe. So I thought, how easy, like all the work's done for me, they're gonna sell me the clothes and then I'm gonna sell the clothes. That's way easier than trying to find like business licenses and resale licenses and trying to source all these clothes and how do you even start a boutique without like a big name behind you? And I honestly thought that I was just becoming a part of this little small company because there was only like not even 10,000 of us. And that seems even like a lot, but there wasn't even 10,000 of us back when I joined. It was very small in terms of multi-level marketing. It was very small. Um, so I went back and forth, decided and ended up deciding to join. And that wasn't until like February of 2016. 
So I do my whole thing in LuLaRoe. I join very quickly. I'm climbing the ranks. My upline is telling me that I'm a rock star, that I'm a firecracker, that I'm going to be a coach in no time, a mentor in no time. I hit the first major rank um, in three months, which I think at the time was really unheard of. It was very, very quick that I that I got so many people underneath me so quickly. And I never actually recruited anybody. Um, people came to me asking questions and I would answer them from my experience. And they'd be like, oh, I really wanted to join this. I want to join. Can I be on your team? And I'd be like, sure, here's my link. Um, I thought I was doing really well. <laughs> if you look at the team training videos that I did, I, I thought I, I addressed a lot of the issues we had, but it felt like every single time I addressed one issue, two or three more would pop up. And it just got worse and worse each month in terms of products and questions that I couldn't answer. And even when I went to my uplines to try to get answers, I was told, you know, like, oh, that's a weird thing we've never heard of before. Um, and a lot of times it was just sort of pushed off or I was told it would get looked into and no one really ever had an answer for me. Um, so that was always sort of really disappointing and something that I was like, man, I wish... I wish that was easier. It was done easier, done better. And, you know, you'd ask the company and they would always say, well, we're a baby company. You know, we've only been around for three years. Like we're going to have hiccups. We're still learning the ropes. We're still figuring out all the bumps. Like we'll take that in consideration. Thank you. We're, we're just a baby company. Mind you, LuLaRoe still claims to be a baby company, even now. I don't know. I feel like they're a second grader or something right now. Um, so <laughs> I started getting... The, uh, the infamous poop in the wet bathing suit, wet clothes in probably summer of 2016. There's like three or four independent boxes with different things. There was wet dresses, there was wet leggings, there was wet shirts. Um, nobody had any answer for me when I asked. Uh, I got the stinky leggings, the ones that were really, really, really bad. Um, <laughs> even two years after I opened them, they were still bad. And, uh, and um, it was just a difficult Oh, my dog came in to say hello. Hello, dog. It's nice to see you. <laughs> all right, buddy. So I started getting all the stinky stuff, which, you know, disgusting. Um, I remember going to complain and I filled out a form on one of their websites. And the form had a drop down menu of like what you were complaining about. And I remember very distinctly that one of the drop down items said stinky leggings. And I thought to myself, dang, like this has to be a big enough problem that they've created their own drop down menu option for this exact thing. Um, and then the emails went back and forth and it was like, you know, okay, we've resolved it. And I said, no, you haven't. And I would reopen the ticket and it would go back and forth. And I want to say eventually they credited me some money or something like that. But again, they were back office credits. So I couldn't get my money back. They were just back office credits that I've talked about before in other interviews where to get your money back, you'd have to spend more money. And the minimum order was 33. So even if I wanted to get my you know, $47 back for my stinky leggings, I had to spend at least $500 to even use that small credit. So even in that, there was another purchasing scam in that that was really just awful. Um, that I don't think anybody called them out on and anybody that did call them out on it was called negative and was probably blocked. That was pretty normal back then. Um, I stayed with LuLaRoe for, uh, about 18, 19 months or so. Um, I started getting pretty disenfranchised around the beginning of 2017. Um, there were a lot of rumors that there were things, changes happening. And the reason that the changes were happening was because the company had been running illegally. Um, I started looking into that and I was like, oh my gosh, we're an illegal pyramid scheme. That's fun. That's awesome. Great. So, um, you know, I, I didn't really know it at the time, but looking back on it now, like that's exactly what it was, but I didn't know it at the time. And any question that I had, like, is this illegal? Um, was answered with, well, no, 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 no. Like it was set up that way because like we had to set it up this way first to be able to set it up this other way. Secondly, so like it had to be that way for a little bit of time, but like we're totally moving towards the new way, which is the right way. So it's okay. And it's like, you didn't really answer my question. Like is yes or no is like enough of an answer. 
Um, but it was always these like backhanded weird questions where you know, these answers to these questions that didn't make any sense, but at the same time made complete sense. So you didn't ever ask another question. Um, I started seeing a lot of things happening that my team was suffering. People below me couldn't make their sales. I noticed that my sales were dipping. I noticed that we weren't getting as good of items. Um, the prints were disappointing or you would get a lot of repeats of the same stuff. It seemed like there was way more than the 5,000 prints that they claimed way more because even though one of the, the benefits of LuLaRoe and having different inventory between everybody, all of a sudden you start looking around, everybody has the same inventory. You're looking, you're like, well, yeah, like I have that, but in a medium, not a large. So it's different, but it's not. And our inventories were very much the same, even though they claimed that it wouldn't be, which was one of the reasons that I originally had signed up. Um, and the stuff that I was getting in the beginning was actually really great. They just, you know, they saw the fact that people would buy it whether or not they could see it. And they started realizing that they could put crap in there and that people couldn't really complain about it. Um, and so if you put only two or three good things and fill the rest of the box with junk, they'd have to buy another box to get more good stuff. And this whole sort of gambling scheme of like dopamine addiction started happening where people would just buy boxes, hoping to get a couple good things to fund their next box. Basically, like if I just get like 10 items, I could sell those, I could buy another box. And hopefully that box has more than 10 items that are good. Um, it was a really, really bad, vicious cycle, unfortunately. Um, I started seeing that kind of stuff. I started asking some questions. I was then invited on the cruise. I was not, I was not, <laughs> I didn't qualify for the cruise. Um, I did not care about going on the cruise, but I was asked if I wanted to go and I thought, why not free vacation, right? Here's another thing in like multi-level marketing when you get these free cars, these free trips, these free vacations, these free cruises, these whatever free things they're not free a lot of times they make you pay taxes on it um we didn't have to pay taxes on it but what we got was literally just the basic bottom floor like basic cabin for free so i mean i didn't even have a window or anything like that it was in the middle of the ship it was not a bad room I, the bed was comfortable enough but um that's what you get is you get like the very, 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 very basic. There was no food package other than like the basic buffets and restaurants. There was no drink package other than the basic like lemonade water and iced tea. Um, it was in Florida and I live in San Diego. So I not only had to fly to Florida, but I don't have a car in Florida. So then I had to get an Uber, which was like $100 each way to the port. And the the boat left so early in the morning that I had to fly in the night before. And so I had to get a hotel room as well. So that and all those costs are never talked about when you get a quote unquote free vacation. And um, I want to say our free LuLaRoe cruise ended up costing about three grand, which is definitely not free. <laughs> um, it was fun, but here's the, here's the thing. I was on in 2017, LuLaRoe had so many cruise qualifiers that they had to have two sh cruise ships. One was a full LuLaRoe cruise that was decked out in all the LuLaRoe colors, every single floor and room, and everything was like full LuLaRoe. It was a dry cruise. It was like every event, like there was no way you could blend in um, and not go to things because it was really like 100% LuLaRoe. The second cruise was on a bigger ship. They had a smaller ship. We got a bigger ship. And we got to go on the second cruise and it was half LuLaRoe and half regular people on vacation. And so that for me was really awesome because I was there to vacation. I was there to spend my time um, on a cruise ship eating steak every night <laughs> and drinking endless blue Hawaiians and enjoying sunsets, you know, and having a good time on vacation. I wasn't there to sell clothes. There were people that brought clothes to do live sales in their rooms. I thought that was weird. There were people that were there that were just like there because they were so excited to meet home office and they followed them around. Um, they had to have special like meet and greet times for the, the owners of LuLaRoe because people were so obnoxious. I remember sitting in one of the restaurants and Deanne and her family were all sitting next to us at the table. And she's the owner of LuLaRoe, if you don't know. <laughs> 
and they were sitting in the same restaurant and like people were coming in and taking pictures with them and, and saying like, oh my gosh, hello, it's so nice to see you. And it was so weird to see these just totally normal people being idolized like they were some sort of like, I don't know, king or prophet or like God to be worshipped. It was really awkward and weird. And so that sort of like clicked something in me too. Like, what the heck? That's weird. Um, I remember coming back from the cruise, being a little more energized about my business. Like, oh man, I want to do that again. That was fun. Like, let's qualify for next year. Um, but at the same time, not completely 100% back on board with LuLaRoe. Pretty much all of 2017 was like a seesaw for me. Like, do I stay or do I go? Is this good or is this bad? Then Disney came out and I got reinvigorated and I got to go to the Disney um, launch at California Adventure. And there was this very special like LuLaRoe themed world of color um, water and light show that night where they were like launching everything. And we all got free Disney when we left and we got a hotel room and stayed the night and went to Disneyland and like went and had dinner and spent again on this quote unquote free trip. Although it wasn't free because I think we even had to pay to go to the launch. Um, luckily I lived in Southern California, but I had one of my girls fly in to go. Cause I was like, Oh, if you want to come, you can come with me. And she was like, oh, I'm flying in. So she flew in. So she paid for airfare. Then I had to go pick her up in the morning. Um, and then we got a hotel room. I mean, it was a lot of money and a lot of time away and it was fun, but I mean, at what cost? Right. Um, so there were things like that. Then the Disney rules for LuLaRoe were just so obnoxious, just so obnoxious. I mean, I was listening to him the other day because I'm working on a project and I was like, I cannot believe that I agreed to these. These are ridiculous rules. Um, <laughs> it was just really, really silly. So then people started speaking out about LuLaRoe. Um, there was the 100% buyback and everybody started joining. It was this mass influx of people the quality started going down. The defective group was created because all these people were getting holes in their leggings. I had people claiming, you know, like, oh, these are shredding on my body. And I'm like, I have no idea what's happening. I would send people free leggings. I don't know how much I gave away in free stuff because I had to replace all these leggings that were just shredding. I don't even know if LuLaRoe ever credited me back any of that. I have stacks of buy of, um, back order slips and returns and things that I don't even think were ever fully refunded to me completely. Um, so, you know, I have no idea how much anything is owed anywhere to me from LuLaRoe. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so I just started seeing it and people started leaving. And then I started realizing really how fragile this team I had built and this they call it a tree in LuLaRoe. That's why I use it in the Vice documentary. It's not because I don't understand that a tree is also a triangle shape. It's because I'm talking to people in LuLaRoe and I want to talk to them. I'm not talking to, you know, Kevin and Brad who are <laughs> commenting in the YouTube channel, like comment section. I, I'm trying to talk to those that are still stuck in the cult when I use the word tree. But my tree started to crumble and people started to leave that were at the bottom, which, you know, I mean, Really, honestly, the only way for the top to make money is for there to be a continuous chain of new people at the bottom. It's just, it's been mathematically proven so many times. I just, I can't explain it again. <laughs> like It's just mathematically impossible for it to happen. So as I started to see that, and I knew how much work it took to even get those people to fill those holes so that I could continue to grow because that's what I was told I had to do. And that's what I was told that was, this is the way that you have to do this. Um, I started to realize that it was just impossible that that there was that there was no way that I could sustain this, that this was a giant scam and it was literally tumbling and crumbling and I could see it happening. And um, as people started to tell me they were leaving, you know, at first I was like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. People are leaving. Then I started realizing, you know, it's gonna happen. Just bless, you know, like just just <laughs> just say, I, I wish you the best and, you know, I, I hope that you, um, you know, get out and, 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 and flourish elsewhere and I wish you the best in, in whatever you do next. Um, and I didn't understand why people were leaving um, fully yet. Um, I started looking into it. My friends started talking to me that had left, the ones that still talked to me. And I remember we went out on a, 
and like a coffee night or a, a wine and cheese night or something at one of their houses. And they had all left and I hadn't, and we sat around there talking and they were like, you gotta leave. And I, I was expressing my concern. And that was one of the first times too, that I was like, okay, I think I really need to leave. I really need to figure out an extra, an exit stra strategy and an exit plan because I had seen people leave before to, with disastrous results. And I knew that that I didn't want that to happen to me. I wanted to leave really quietly. I didn't want to deal with the stress and the drama. I didn't want the anxiety. I didn't want to be afraid of my phone. Um, and so I tried to leave very easily and simply. That was brought with, oh, no, no, you can't leave. See, the problem with me leaving, because I had such a large leg underneath me, was that when I left, my upline's leg crumbled too. Because I was a, a, a big enough leader and had enough girls on me, under me, that um, if I left, she would lose me and she needed me to continue her rank and to keep her rank. And <laughs> I knew that I was in sort of a position of power that she needed me to stay. And I wasn't really sure what to do. We had this long 45 minute conversation about how I needed to stay because Christmas was coming and Halloween was coming and Elegant was coming and all of these new capsule launches were coming and this new stuff was coming and Nightmare Before Christmas was coming and I had to stay because I was going to miss out on all of it. And it was like so, so, so important that I didn't miss out on it because it were such good money makers. And I said, fine, I'll stay, I'll stay. And then I remember coming home and I'm being like, I didn't quit. I should have quit and I didn't quit. And I should have quit. And, and, and I said I would stay longer. Um, and I knew in like my heart of hearts, the way that everything was happening, the way that the buyback was happening, um, the way that all of these policies that they had put in place were like being rolled back and it was hurting a lot of people. I had, I had girls on my team that were like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay my mortgage this month. I had girls on my team that were like, my husband and I are thinking about getting divorced. Um, I had girls on my team that were like, I might have to file bankruptcy. And these were things that I felt really responsible for because when I joined, it was a great opportunity again, because I was close to the top. And, um, you know, I, I genuinely thought that it could work for everybody else. And it doesn't. I mean, that's just the way that pyramid schemes and multi-level marketing are structured. The money has to come from somewhere. And it just comes from that endless recruiting of new people who leave and you get somebody else to replace them. And while they're there, you convince them to buy as much as you possibly can. I mean, that's just, that's just what it is. And I think anybody that's listening that doesn't genuinely believe that is lying to themselves because you've sat in those recruiting rooms and those, you know, how to grow your team webinars. And this is basically the advice they give you. You have to always be sharing the opportunity and always be willing to send them your sign up link and always be willing to get them to join your team because that's the way to make the real good money. Right? So I decided to leave. I was like, I can't do this anymore. This is like, the end. And I typed everything up to say goodbye. And um, I just hit send. I, ha I had my husband hit send. I asked him to proofread it, but he was busy playing video games. So he just hit send. And um, it was very final. But at the same time, it felt like a really big weight had been lifted off my shoulders. And I thought, oh, good, I'm done. I was very um, kind. I just said that my values really didn't line up anymore. And it was just like a personal decision and I needed more time with my family and it was just gotten to the point where it's too much. I tried not to disparage the company at all with my own personal bias because I didn't want to hurt anybody else on my page that was still in. I didn't want them to unfriend me. I didn't want them to be mad at me for leaving. I was really afraid that people would be mad at me for leaving. Um, again, that's a grooming technique because they make you think that you'll know, you know, they make you think they will be mad at you if you leave. So when you leave and they're mad at you, it like, you know, it comes to fruition and it's just this vicious cycle of psychological and emotional abuse, which I will love to get into this season. I'm very excited to get into that kind of stuff as well, because I really want people to understand what I went through and what so many other people that message me on the daily, you know, they say, I, I saw your Vice documentary and oh my God, like I related 
to the whole like ostrac like like being ostracized from the company and like just being excommunicated um, from your friends. So that was really hard for me when that happened, you know. And again, I was a, a young mom. My daughter wasn't even in school yet. I think she was in like TK, which is like kindergarten before kindergarten, and just a couple hours a day. So. You know, I, I didn't have a lot of friends in the community because I wasn't really in the community that much. I had my clients, but I had left working in the salon to do LuLaRoe full time. So I wasn't even really seeing them, which is another thing. They, they always want you to quit your job because you think, oh, well, I got to focus all my energy on my MLM. But really, it's just to make you dependent on the MLM. They don't care if you're focusing all of your energy or none of your energy as long as you're hitting those quotas and spending that money. They just don't want you to have any outside influence. And then when you leave your job and you abandon all of your benefits, then you have to stay with your company because they're, you know, your only lifeline now. So I started to see that, you know, they were trying to get me to convince my husband at the time to, uh, to quit his job as well. And thank God he was like, uh, I like my job because that would have been a disaster. So I, I do I do appreciate that. Um, he saw the light before I did, but he wasn't in the cult. I was. He wasn't being emotionally manipulated. I was. So, you know, even for husbands out there that are listening to this, like if your wife or your girlfriend or your sister or your mom or anybody you care about, I mean, even your partner, your boyfriend or your your husband, whoever, uh, you know, if if someone you love is stuck in a multi-level marketing company, it doesn't matter how much factual information you're going to give them um, because the, the multi-level marketing company is always going to have a rebuttal to anything you say. They already have the answer to any question that you may put in anybody's mind about anything in this industry. So it's just really important to listen when people ask for help or if someone stuck in one of these schemes has a question about something going well wait a second that doesn't make sense because this 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 and this that's your in to say oh well okay well let's explain that and let's talk about that and oh well this is why this isn't working for you um that's always been the best way that i've been able to approach multi-level marketing with people because people come to me and go wait, is this a multi-level market? Is this a bad company? And, you know, I have to explain and they go, but I really like the mascara or the nail polish strips or the whatever. And I have to explain that it's not the product that's inherently bad. Although a lot of times you're paying a premium for the product because everybody's bonuses and free things are built into the price of the product. But it's the business model that's predatory. And it's the business model that um, is concerning. And it goes a lot deeper than just it being concerning. I mean, people ask me, well, how come they're just not illegal? And, you know, the short answer is the government protects them. And the long answer is make might break your heart, you know? Um, so for me, I just, I saw enough that I decided to leave. And I saw enough that when I reached out to people that had left and talked to them, they gave me the answers that I needed to hear. Um, and when I asked the MLM, you know, they gave me the answers that they thought that would keep me there, that would manipulate me the, the easiest. You know, you're going to miss this. You know, like, what about your customers? Like, they, they rely on you. Um, a lot of guilt and manipulation to stay. And I started to recognize that and, and realize that I didn't want to be in, in an abusive, manipulative relationship with a business. Like <laughs> I didn't want to be abused by a company. And so I knew that I had to leave. Um, within 45 minutes of me posting that and leaving and saying all that, my upline was messaging me, telling me that I had betrayed her. How dare you do this to me? Because she knew like she had lost a big leg and she was most likely never going to be able to build that leg up the way that it had been before. Because mathematically, there just aren't enough people in the world to do that successfully. Um, and so, you know, I was, I mean, for a couple weeks bombarded with text messages, um, people faking that they were supportive of my decision and then they would immediately block me or people would say things that didn't make any sense. I remember my upline, um, my, my mentor, when I was the one that I had reached out to on YouTube, um, I said to her, you know, she goes, oh, I, I heard you're leaving. I'm sorry to see you go. 
I said, yeah, it just doesn't work for me anymore. And she goes, okay, well, let me know where I can get good bobby pins. And I was like, wow, okay, cool. Thanks so much. <laughs> like, I was like, that was a really just totally exactly what I would thought you would have said. Like, thank you so much for being so supportive. You can buy bobby pins anywhere I can buy. Um, so hot off me leaving LuLaRoe and being incredibly vulnerable again because now I didn't have a job anymore. Um, I was no longer working in the salon. Um, I didn't have any income stream. I still had bills, but I didn't have any money coming in. I was now going out of business with LuLaRoe. So I was selling everything for very, 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 very cheap, which, you know, paid for a little bit here and there, but nothing like I had been making before. And there was some financial hardship, you know, I couldn't pay some bills and there was some stuff, you know, my credit took a hit and things happen. You know, it happens to all of us. And it's such a relatable experience that I think a lot of people like have stigmatized it where they don't want to talk about it because they feel like a failure. But that's the whole point of this podcast is that I'm sick and tired of people thinking they're failures in an industry that is literally designed for you to fail. So in some sort of weird, bizarro way, you're actually succeeding in multi-level marketing when you fail because that's what you're supposed to do. It's designed to drive all the money upward. So if you failed, bravo. You are just another link in the chain, another cog in the machine. You are the reason that the companies continue to do this. And you shouldn't feel shame. You shouldn't feel bad about it. A lot of people get stuck in these schemes. A lot of people lose money in these schemes. 99.7% of people break even or lose money when all is said and done. That's a lot. That's more than gambling. That's more than putting $99 in a slot machine and hitting max bet. You have a 95% chance of losing the money there. And if you were to join an actually illegal pyramid scheme, like the airplane game they talk about in the dream or those blessing circles that come around at Christmas time, you have a 90.7% chance of loss in that. So it's actually a better financial decision to gamble your money away or join an illegal pyramid scheme. Illegal, I mean, they're all illegal technically, right? Right? But illegal in terms of what the government wants to say is legal and illegal. You have a better chance of making your money or some money in those rather than a multi-level marketing company. Um, those are not numbers that I made up. Those are numbers you can find everywhere. Those are very, very, very easily found numbers when you just Google loss rate of and then type in anything. Loss rate of gambling, loss rate of pyramid scheme, loss rate of multi-level marketing. Check it out. It's interesting. It's interesting what you can see. Um, and these are all factual statistical data points that are created from the numbers that the companies themselves provide um, based on FTC guidelines and things like that. So it's as accurate as information as the company is willing to give us. And so that is the information that we use to come up with these figures. If those companies don't like those figures, then maybe they should give us more accurate information. I don't know. What a novel idea. Um, so right after the heels of me leaving LuLaRoe and being incredibly vulnerable, I did what most people did because I was broke and I joined another MLM. But here's the thing. I didn't realize I was joining another MLM. I was preyed upon by an ex LuLaRoe girl that I had reached out to after I had left who was having legal troubles because she was speaking out against LuLaRoe claiming things that weren't true and LuLaRoe was going after her. I reached out to her and I said, hey, I know you're a blogger. Here's some articles about journalistic integrity with bloggers and proving that bloggers can be journalists as well. Hope this helps because there was this lawsuit about that. You can Google it if you want to know more. I'm not going to disparage anybody. Um, so she was like, oh, cool. Thanks. What are you doing now? And I was like, oh, well, you know, I don't know. I'm probably going to go back to the salon, which I did. Or, you know, do something else. I haven't figured it out yet. And she's like, well, I have this other company that's so amazing, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I don't know about that. I'm not really looking to do the sales thing again. And she's telling me, well, you know, it's nothing like LuLaRoe because it's not closed and you don't, you don't have to deal with shipping. And it's all the things that you hated about LuLaRoe. It's all, you know, it's, it's so great. Just give it a try. And I said, again, I don't know if I want to do this. I, I uh, you know, the pressure. And it's just like, why don't you take no for an answer? Like, why do I have to, as, as a female, I don't know if this is something that other females feel, but as a female, I always feel so much guilt. 
And I always feel so bad all the time, like societal pressure to like be nice. <laughs> So for me, I'm just like, um, I don't know. And she's like, well, let me send you a huge packet of free stuff. I've been authorized to give these like $500 um, value kits for their $39.99. I said, okay, fine. I'll try the stuff. So she sends me this link so that I can sign up to get the stuff. And I guess unbeknownst to me, I was actually signing up to sell Modere, which I was like, this is, I didn't even realize it until like three or four days later, I got a letter in the mail from them with like my debit card that was like, welcome to the family. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Um, so then she added me to all these groups and I thought, okay, let's give this a try. I tried some of the stuff in the box that I got. Eh, again, you know, it's not horrible stuff, but it's not anything better than I can literally buy at the grocery store or like... CVS or Rite Aid or Walgreens. I mean, it's Target level stuff. It's not Ulta or Sephora or Neiman Marcus level. It's it's Target level, which is fine. It's Walmart level, which is fine. But I'm not going to pay Nordstrom prices <laughs> for, you know, Kmart products. I'm just not going to. Um, and the products were eh, and they were okay, but they weren't they weren't worth it. And so I ended up just selling it all on eBay. And I, I think I made a couple hundred bucks. So I made my money back and I was like, wow, I found a profitable, I found a way to be profitable in multi-level marketing, uh, sell it on eBay. So <laughs> just probably, probably why we're not allowed to do that. <laughs> um, so, so I think I, I was with Modere for like three weeks. I don't even think I sold anything. And if I did sell anything and got any commissions on anything, it's probably all still on that card because I don't even think I ever activated the card. Um, it just wasn't wasn't something that I I wanted to do. It just it was not anything that I wanted to get back into. So I still hadn't speak spoken out about multi level marketing publicly, but at this point I had realized that I had been a part of three of these businesses, and they were pretty much all the same. They were all very predatory and psychologically just bad. They just were just mess messing my head up and making me feel things and making me um do things and, and act a certain way that wasn't me and um I, I didn't like it <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> so around that time i joined the now defunct facebook group that was called defective and it was well it was defective is what we called it but it was like defective leg lularo defective leggings slash something, 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 torn, slash, all this stuff. It was this huge, long, I have no idea what the, what the name was called, but we called it Defective. And it was a group of people that had left LuLaRoe, and um, it was just a group of people that had grievances against LuLaRoe. It was ex-consultants, ex-customers, people that were currently buying, people that were currently selling. Um, anybody that really had any sort of grievance against LuLaRoe, it was also a place where the Defective Leggings lawsuit was sort of I think taking form and, and people were talking about this with the, the fingers going through the, the leggings and it ripping like wet toilet paper and all this stuff. This is sort of where everybody was talking and we were piecing together all these stories of, wait, you got stinky leggings too? Wait, you got wet clothes too? And all of a sudden it was all of us in a forum where we could publicly speak and we weren't blocked and muted and, and, and our comments weren't deleted and we were able to speak to each other very candidly and openly about our experiences within LuLaRoe. And we started realizing that that so many of us had so many similarities to our stories. And I started feeling like it just like, oh my God, like someone needs to know about this. Someone needs to, to hear the story. It's so much bigger than, than it's being made out to be in, in the media. And I think one of the reasons that a lot of times multi-level marketing isn't showcased in the media and showcased in stories is that not a lot of people want to talk about it. Uh, people feel that stigma. Like I talked about that failure. I don't, I don't want to tell people that I failed at Amway. I don't want to tell people that I failed at Mary Kay. I don't want to tell people that I failed at Melaleuca. Um, and, and again, you know, I, it goes right back to what I was saying is like, you're not a failure in a company that's designed for you to fail. Like you, you did, you, completed your objective. You just didn't know that was the objective because you were lied to. And so I decided I just need to end the stigma, right? I'm just going to speak out. I'm just going to speak out and I'm going to tell people what I think. And I'm going to talk to any anybody that wants to hear my story, anybody that wants to hear what happened to me. 
anybody that wants to learn what's going on in this company. And I would listen to other people's stories and, and I would tell them and I created this sort of discussion around LuLaRoe and, and what was going on in the company. And it gained sort of a little bit of a cult following in the media. And I started working with, um, with, with writers uh, at Business Insider and Bloomberg. Uh, I worked with the Today Show, although my segment never aired. I worked with um, a mini documentary company called Split, which I think you have to pay a fee to watch it. But I did a little uh, documentary with this company called Split. Um, I did the Vice documentary. I've done so many podcasts and YouTube shows and channels. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I. I spoke to so many people and, and I always was like, I just want to get the story out there. And because I spoke out, you know, all of these other people came to me and, and started sharing their stories with me and other media outlets came to me and other projects came to me and other bigger entities came to me saying, Hey, I heard that you're the person that knows, or I heard you're the person that has evidence, or I heard you're the person that can find me the person. And I sort of started working behind the scenes. Um, so yeah, I started working behind the scenes on a lot of things in 2018. Um, I was working behind the scenes with the investigators of the Washington um, Pyramid Scheme lawsuit. They came to me in early 2018 and said, we, we hear that you're the person that knows all the people that knows all the stuff. And I said, let's go. Um, I was actually dis uh, I was actually deposed, um, served and deposed and, um, did my deposition in the summer and we were supposed to take the stand, uh, on the 16th of February and, uh, which is coming up and, you know, they settled, um, at the beginning of the month, two weeks before I was supposed to take the stand. And that was really exciting. I think that's a win. I'm going to call that a win for our case. I would have loved to see us get a bigger, set bigger settlement by going to trial. But when you go to trial, there's a lot more fees and there would have been a smaller restitution payment for the consultants. And so, um, I believe that Bob Ferguson made the best decision when they decided to settle and, and make $4 million available in restitution for over 3,000 consultants in Washington. I'm not even a Washingtonian. And, you know, I, again, it's that, that need to help the person that doesn't have the voice for themselves. Um, and so I was so proud to be a part of that and so proud to help get justice for Washington and, and the consultants in Washington. I had a few girls on my team in Washington, so I'm happy that I was able to help them get a check or soon to be. The checks should start rolling out um, April, May, end of April, beginning of May. If you have questions about that, I do have some stuff on my Facebook page, which is my name, Roberta Blevins, or you can find me if you search uh, the real Roberta Blevins on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I post all that information so you're able to find it. Um, if you can't find it, message me and I will try to find it for you uh, if you have questions. Um, I was kind of sad that I I didn't get to show my evidence in the case because I had I had pyramid scheme evidence. Uh, remember when I told you that my team above me was sad to see me go because my, my, my leg was so big and her team would crumble. So they came to me at a point where I was really broke and needed the money. And, and they said, hey, would you transfer your team over to Mary, this girl Mary? Will you transfer your team over? She'll pay $500. And I said, well, you know, I have bills to pay and I could use that. And, you know, if, if I if I had quit LuLaRoe um, without signing my team over, everything would have rolled up and the girls underneath me would have, would have, you know, just gotten lost in a bigger team and a shuffle. And, uh, you know, I thought that I was doing the best for everybody at the time. Um, it ended up working out because it ended up being evidence in a pyramid scheme lawsuit case, which was great. But, you know, I was helping the girl to, to keep her team bit bigger. And I was getting a little bit of money for myself so that I could pay some bills. And I thought I was helping everybody at the time. And, and it also allowed me to leave LuLaRoe um, sort of just by signing my name away without a big fight or anything like that. And then I was able to immediately start um, speaking out online, talking to the media and all of that. Um, so that evidence I thought really proved that multi-level marketing is all about the recruiting that I was able to sell. I don't know. I want to say it was like 20 people that were still left. Um, 
I, I've heard people selling teams for way more. I've even gotten emails and messages from other teams and other people and other MLMs who have said, uh, you know, I was I was asked to sell my team, or you know, someone is trying to get me to sell my team. I don't really sell for this company anymore, but I still get a residual check, and someone's trying to get me to sell my team because they're trying to to leverage the money on their, you know, to, into their benefit more. Um, and it's very interesting to me that you can do that in multi level marketing. So, but, you know, I've been out of multi-level marketing and in and, and the world of MLM since September of 2000, well, maybe September, October of 2017. Did three of them, which I find that at the people I talk to, the average is three to five before it takes you to realize that it's not you, it's the business model. And you're like, oh, it's not me. It's the business model. It's the way this company is set up. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening with me uh, this year, uh, aside from this new podcast that I'm so excited that you guys stayed to listen this long. Um, please bear with me. I will get better on the ums and the uhs. <laughs> and you won't have to listen to me ramble on just my voice because going forward, I will be talking with all of those wonderful people um, that have stories have stories to, to share, uh, experts with expert advice to share and other anti-MLM advocates and creators who will share their stories as well. Um, if you're interested in having your story told by me on our podcast, I would love for you to reach out to me. My email is therealrobertablevins at gmail.com. So just hit me up, make sure you spell it right. <laughs> um, and hit me up. I would love to have you on the show in some capacity to to share your story. Um, I think the more relatable the stories are, the more people we can affect and the more people that we can reach. Um, Multi-level marketing is protected by our government and woven into the very financial and economic fabric of our society. So it's gonna be really difficult to make them illegal, unfortunately. But if you can't make them illegal, you can hopefully educate those so they don't join them and they fold because no one wants to join them anymore. These companies are a scourge on our society. They chew you up and spit you out and they make a lot of problems for a lot of people that just wanted the best for their lives and their families. I hope that you subscribe and tell your friends about this podcast. This is my little baby, and I would love to be able to tell everybody's story and end the stigma behind multi-level marketing. I wanna make it a topic that people can talk about without feeling ashamed. And I wanna teach people how to talk to those that are stuck in these cults and get them out. And I also want to maybe reach people that are in multi-level marketing that have had that little chip on their shoulder and that little question in their head and that little what if or you know anything that they makes them think twice about anything. As I hope that you find this podcast and you find something that's relatable and that you're able to make the right decisions for yourself and your family. Again, I want to thank you for spending the last hour with me on my maiden voyage on Life After MLM. And I hope that you join us um, as we work out our schedule and we start getting people interviewed and we start getting these episodes up. Thank you so much. You are amazing. Thank you for giving me a platform uh, and, and giving volume to my voice so that we can help as many people as possible. And lastly, I want to say that 2021 is going to be a really super badass year for the anti-MLM movement. And I cannot wait to share everything that I've been working on and as soon as I can share, obviously, you guys will be the first to know. <laughs> I will see you next time. Have a great day. Bye.